Today we're gonna to be looking at industrial radioactive smoke detectors. One that I've had on the channel before and one that is new to me. So let's take a look and see what makes both of these different and why this one is way more radioactive than this one. So what are these? These are Pyrotronics F3 and F35A industrial smoke detectors. Now I say industrial in that these were mainly used in factories and in power plants. Actually, when I was at the San Onofre nuclear power generating station to make a video about that place, about the decommissioning of the nuclear power station, I did notice that they had a bunch of smoke detectors that looked very similar to these exact units. And I'm pretty sure they used these ones. Uh, these are more of a very earlier model and I think it would kind of screw up their whole radiologically controlled area if they had something that was emitting a lot of radon gas, which uh, these do. They do emit a lot of radon gas. And so I'm pretty sure inside of the San Onofre Nuclear Power Generating Station that they would probably have used these instead, the americium based ones. The different models use different radioactive isotopes. And so this one uses radium-226. This one uses americium-241. And they switched away from the radium-based ones to the americium ones because this smoke detector is very radioactive. It actually has a warning on it that says to avoid prolonged exposure within 15 inches of detector. It's a, probably a good uh, idea here. I mean, I'm kind of like right inside of that 15 inches threshold and the radiation is pretty intense right next to this thing. And so, you know, as soon as I'm done with this video, I'm going to pack both of these up because these are not items that I feel comfortable having in my house. These are usually reserved for more kind of collector situations where I pull them out and use them for videos or uh, certain uh, experiments where I need a, a high intensity alpha source uh, or something along those, uh, you know, something along that nature, or if I need to test out uh, the higher limit function of a Geiger counter to see what it will actually do. And it does give off a lot of radiation. And just to show you that really quick, I got my Rad IB20, I'm gonna turn it on. And so you can see if I'm pointing it away, it's fine. And even with this one right here, it's okay. But the minute I go to this one, it's much louder. So even from this far away, I'm getting around 13,000 counts per minute, which is pretty strong. If you put this right up to it, it's gonna go to 430,000 counts per minute. So the radiation uh, increases dramatically the closer you get to this thing because there's a considerable field of radiation. If you want to talk about radiation as a field, it's, it's kind of like that. It's kind of like a, a cloud in that the radiation gets more intense the closer you get to this object. Uh, the same thing with this one, except for this one only mainly puts out alpha radiation. It does emit some gamma radiation, but they're low level gammas. And so they're kind of harder to detect and it seems like they're not as penetrating. Whereas the radium one, this one gives off uh, hard gammas that are able to uh, penetrate uh, much more material. And this also gives off alpha and beta radiation. So the beta radiation is basically electrons uh, traveling very, very fast. And those are able to go uh, about six feet in the air before they're stopped by just the, the air molecules in the air. Also, these F3 pyrotronic smoke detectors, the radium version is much harder to find than these americium F3 5A pyrotronic smoke detectors. You can actually find these on eBay rather easily, whereas these only pop up every once in a great while. Uh, I've only seen them on there once and uh, never again. So we'll see if that actually uh, changes in the future. So where do these radioactive sources come from? Radium-226 is a naturally occurring radioactive element that comes from uranium. And so it actually takes several tons of uranium ore to get one gram of radium. One gram is about the weight of a small paperclip or a dollar bill. So then there's americium-241. Now americium-241 is a transuranic element. It's a synthetic isotope, man-made. Transuranic usually means that it's an element that is made during the fission process inside of a nuclear reactor. And so they actually get this from processing spent nuclear fuel. So in one ton of spent nuclear fuel, you're probably gonna get out 100 grams 
of americium 241 and so that's probably the other reason too why they switched over from radium to americium is that americium was one of those things that was kind of coming about during the nuclear age when they were started to have nuclear reactors and so they would process out the americium and other isotopes out of the spent nuclear fuel and so that became commercially available for them to use in these smoke detectors whereas radium that which they had a lot of because they've been extracting radium for a very long time since the early 1900s they have been extracting radium and using it in clocks and in watches and in aircraft gauges and stuff like that and so it's a very widely available radioactive isotope but the problem is is like all that unwanted uh, other types of radiation that come along with a source like this all that extra beta and hard gamma radiation that is very difficult to shield against that's why they went over to americium 241 because it mainly emits alpha radiation it does emit uh, gamma radiation when it decays into neptunium but that gamma radiation is at a much lower energy and so it's a little easier to shield uh, against than uh, the radium and all the other daughters all the decay products of radium that come after it so when i say that these are intensely radioactive i'm speaking mainly from that these are intensely radioactive sources that normal people might come into contact with because you have industrial sources which uh, far eclipse these sources uh, in uh, radioactivity. But these are really good to use uh, to kind of push Geiger counters to their upper limit. Uh, that's why I uh, use these sources to test the upper limit of this Rad IB20 along with this better Geiger right here and along with this Radicode 101, which I actually did just update the firmware on this. Uh, so it should be energy compensated now, which is what the better Geiger also says that it is, that it is energy compensated. And what does that mean? What does energy compensation mean? And that just means that uh, usually with scintillation detectors, especially, which is what these use, they use like a crystal inside of here, they kind of over respond to lower gamma energies. And that's what this, uh, americium 241 f35a smoke detector emits it emits a lot of low energy gamma radiation and so this detector was actually over responding so it give a much higher number than the other one would and so uh, radicode went and updated the firmware on this and so now it shouldn't overestimate the dose rate on that and actually i did test these out and this was more in line with the other detectors. And so that's good to see. It's, it's good to see that you can actually update that with uh, a firmware and make this uh, a more, um, more exact unit to use when trying to figure out dose rates uh, depending on energy levels of gamma radiation. So some other little facts about the sources inside of these smoke detectors. Americium 241 has a half-life of 432 years, and when that decays, it actually decays into Neptunium 237, which has a half-life of uh, 2,144,000 years. So it's going to be around for some time. Radium 226 decays into radon, which is a radioactive gas. That in turn decays into polonium, radioactive lead, bismuth, polonium, radioactive lead again, bismuth, polonium, and then finally stable non-radioactive lead. And radium has a half-life of 1600 years. So again, both of these are gonna be around for quite some time. Let's get both of these detectors opened up and actually take a look at the radioactive sources inside of them. Now, both of these detectors are meant to be opened up and serviced. This detector has 80 microcuries of radioactive material inside of it. A normal household smoke detector that uses americium might contain 0.5 to 0.9 microcuries of americium 241.
The cap on the top of this post is adjustable from the flathead screw on the other side. This allows more or less of the radioactive foil to be exposed. This source really only overloads this detector when it's brought extremely close. So for both of the simulation detectors, I'm going to switch them over to count rate just to see what the raw information is that's coming in because with dose rate there is some conversion that does happen inside of the detector. MCPM is for million counts per minute. When the radar has this gamma filter on, it is energy compensated. The reason why the Rad IB20 had a higher number is probably because of the surface area of the detector. Both of these detectors have two ionization chambers. That's why they have two locations of radioactive source material. The foil on the inside of this cap is where the other sources of americium-241 are contained. If these sources were right up against the detector, it would send it into overload. Now let's look at the F3 version of these smoke detectors, the radium version. Twenty microcuries of radium is about twenty micrograms of material. So I put the post on the wrong side of the detector just to see how much gamma radiation is coming through. There is a Radi B20ER that can handle the extended range of this source and not overload. I unfortunately do not have that one. So as you can see, even when this source leaves the frame, it is still making this detector scream. Since the better Geiger takes a little while to accumulate its dose rate, I sped up the clips in certain areas. So when you see the numbers going really fast, that's what's happening here.
So when I took apart this F3 smoke detector, I noticed that the internals were actually radioactive, the ones that didn't have any source material in them. And the reason for that is because when radium decays, it turns into radon, which then turns into a couple different solids that are also radioactive as well. Because radon is a gas, and then polonium and lead and bismuth and all these other radioactive elements that come after the decay of radon are solids. And so it creates this like radioactive dust inside of the detector. Now, these are pretty short-lived isotopes until you get to about uh, lead 210. Lead 210 has a half-life of about 22 years, and so that's gonna be around for quite some time. And then after that, it'll turn into polonium 210, which then has like a half-life of 138 days, 137 days. And so that decays away pretty quickly as well. So now I talk about how these sources are very intense and now they're very intense to me and to people that don't work in a lab or industrial environment because there are plenty of sources out there like um, if you work within uh, the construction industry or are using like soil density gauges or something along those lines, those use very intense radioactive sources, much higher than, than both of these combined. And those can actually be quite dangerous. These aren't even close to those sources. These are still very radioactive and they should be handled with care. Uh, that's also the other reason why I was wearing gloves when I was taking these apart is that the main reason I didn't wanna put uh, the oils from my fingertips, like have that introduced anywhere on that radioactive post where it might cause some type of corrosion in that foil. So that's the main reason why I was wearing those gloves because those gloves aren't gonna protect my hands from radiation because that radiation will just cruise right through those gloves. It doesn't really matter. And so that's why I was doing that. So hopefully you enjoyed this video. If you did, uh, leave a like, maybe a comment, subscribe if you're not already, and I'll see you in the next one. Take it easy. That's better.